When a person is persecuted, they feel the weight of the oppression in direct conflict with their convictions and beliefs. Or they might move between responding in the fleshly realm and fighting back with anger and revenge or responding in the spiritual realm by standing firm in their position and bearing the load of the oppression. Or they just might engage in a little bit of both, going on the offense as well as the defense in the face of betrayal and persecution. Persecutors are the kind of people who spend inordinate amounts of time watching another person's actions and movements so as not to miss out on any positive advances the person might make. They're always ready to step in and turn up the heat to interfere with any forward movement the person who is oppressed might attempt to make. The persecutor has no life outside of the life of the person they seek to oppress. Because you know it's a full-time job trying to keep up with another person's life and yours. <laughs> Think about it. Persecutors find themselves running behind people they seek to oppress, looking for a sign out of a movement or a glance. Uh, they're usually kind of paranoid people, highly judgmental, and just completely consumed with the life and the witness of another person. Betrayal and persecution, two things that will happen to one who seeks to follow God and serve God according to God's purposes. Our basic text for today in the Gospel according to St. Luke, this 21st chapter, directly addresses the betrayals and persecutions that the faithful person of God will undoubtedly encounter for Christ's sake. This unit of scripture is a part of what is commonly referred to as the Olivet Discourse, a sermon delivered by Jesus on the Mount of Olives, as, he, as it is related in the text by St. Luke. And he prophesied about persecutors and betrayers that would seek to kill, steal, and destroy the faithful of God before the end of time. So in this text, we see this strong end times or eschatological strand that runs through and that anticipates the false prophecies and representations that are coming in the last days. We also hear a similar warning in 1 Timothy, where the Apostle Paul warns Timothy about the false doctrine and false teachers in the last days. The ones uh, he talks about are the people of the church and that the people of the church will embrace the people who come and they will become that themselves and they will no longer endure sound doctrine, the Apostle Paul says. But then also in Ephesians 4, we see the people exhorted or encouraged to no longer be like children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but to have a firm foundation in Christ the true and authentic Christ of God. But in this portion of the Olivet Discourse, Luke reports a stopover that Jesus made to talk to those who would indeed encounter persecutions, being falsely accused, being betrayed, and held accountable for things that were not their own. I see this prophecy as quickly gaining entry into our lives today as we are living in the last days. And we should be preparing for what scripture assures us is going to come. But where scripture also directs us on a way to deal with it when it does come. If you truly are a student of Jesus, you will find that Jesus always engaged in radical behavior. He went against the status quo. He challenged the religious leaders on every turn. He touched those who had been deemed ceremonially and spiritually unclean. He hung out with the publicans, the tax collectors who were despised. We've read about that. He allowed his disciples, remember Bible study folk, to eat on the Jewish fasting day, all with the intention of teaching those who were around what was truly important in the kingdom of God. Oh, he, he taught that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The one who loses his life is in a position to save his life. It is not the food that goes in that can corrupt us, but it is what is already inside of us that comes out that makes us unclean. And in this text, Jesus gives us some radical responses to betrayals and persecutions. 
He teaches us how to turn betrayals and persecutions into what I like to call bodacious blessings and perpetual power. In this text, there are three things that we can do that Jesus teaches us when we are faced with betrayal and persecution. The first thing he says is bless your persecutor. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 13, for it will turn out for you an occasion for testimony, what you're going through. Anytime we can share our testimony with someone about who God is through Jesus Christ and the wonder of his grace and mercy in our lives, we are blessing them. The blessing is even more potent when we are professing it to our enemies. Oh, Satan meant it for evil, but God is going to turn it around for our good. Just like Joseph and his brothers, the scripture lets you know that something is different there. Because just there in verse 12, the one that comes before the one I read, they were laying their hands on you and persecuting you, and now you've given your testimony to them. Who's in control then? Mm. Romans says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's a praise statement in and of itself. Oh, it reminds me of Daniel in the lion's den. Not only did Daniel trust God in the face of a ferocious animal, eager to eat him alive, but Daniel went to sleep while he was in the den. Oh, Come on. But the king who sent him there, the scripture says, tossed and turned all night. All right. <laughs> all right. Ephesians 6 and 12 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities. You know what else? Against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 